So I'm from um, PA primarily and um, HRI, and I'm at the Charles Perkins Centre for my research. I do 50-50 um, research and clinical and uh, increasingly um, dominated by cardiac, although I also do neuro. Um, so there's a beautiful picture from my research, um, which is from 4D flow data, but we're going to skip past that for the minute. Hopefully these all work. It'll be a short talk otherwise. Um, so I was going to show you what we do and the views we get in a standard CMR exam. Um, we usually start off with an anatomical one. This isn't playing ball, but it's basically just an axial stack like you might get from a CT, and that helps us plan our study. So from that, uh, we'll get uh, a LVLA view, so a long axis view of the ventricle, and an RVLA view. Um, these are done poorly at many sites, and it does take a bit of skill to get it um, well positioned, and it really matters. Uh, getting it right, otherwise you'll foreshorten things, you'll make um, pathology exist where it doesn't. Um, so there's an RVLA view, uh, that's a reasonable plan for it, probably wants to go slightly more through the apex. These were unselected, this is just whatever it was on my laptop at the time. Um, and you know, you see the tricuspid valve very nicely and you see all the inflow. Um, I'll show you some pictures in a second. Um, since I've been doing 4D flow, I start looking at all these um, dephasing patterns in the atrium a lot more, uh, and I've realised they're really important. Um, uh, but when you're doing it in CINI, they're non-quantitative, so they're just qualitative um, data that is interesting, I guess. Um, so this would be the second uh, view we get after the LVLA and RVLA. We do this every single time for every patient, uh, and it's a technique that works whether you've got complex um, congenital heart disease or a normal heart, um, and it, it does speed the exam up, even though it's a couple of extra views. So that's a poorly planned slice. That should go across the mitral valve, um, and that's a reasonably planned tricuspid one. And then you've got a little bit of angulation in the other plane as well to get that right. Uh, but what we end up here is a reasonable valve view. This isn't a dedicated valve view. Uh, for that, you'd, you'd have a special one for the mitral valve and for the tricuspid, because they don't necessarily come off at exactly the same angle. Um, and this is, a, this is what we call a phase contrast view. So you'll see two sets of images. They're both from the same data. One's a magnitude, one's phase. So the greyed out one here is phase. And you get used to looking at these. So I can tell you there's, there's no TR, sorry, there's no MR and there's a tiny bit of TR here. See that little white, white patch there? That's just some physiological TR. Um, so if you, if you line that up well, um, that gives you information. I then, you know, a minute into the exam, I know how much TR and MR qualitatively there is. And I can sort of be cognizant of that um, as we're doing the study and make sure I, I, I quantitate that properly. Um, so here's a four-chamber view. So we plan it off those three views. Um, I didn't get those arrows right. It's my mistake. That should be lined up straight, bang down through the valve and through the apex for both the RVLA and the LVLA. And um, it, as was mentioned, it's possible to get a very distorted four-chamber view if you don't get the angulation right. And the valve view is really important for that. So getting that so you're right at the level of the valve is really critical. And um, already you, you know what the, the, the RV and LV function are fundamentally um, before you've even done any circles or quantitation, um, if you've done it right. So here's the, the, the sort of money um, sequence. It's a short axis stack, and we'll plan that off the four chamber. Uh, because our four chambers is perfect because we've done it the way we've done it. We've planned it with an LVLA, an RVLA and the valve view. Uh, and so we know that our, our short axis slices are perpendicular to the septum. Um, so this is brilliant for the left side. And the majority of people obviously only do the circles on the left side. And you can do that with semi-automatic, automatic or, or purely by hand. Um, I've found it doesn't actually make much difference to speed because I'm pretty quick with the mouse, mouse these days. So I can do that in about a minute uh, and get the numbers out of the ventricles. Um, uh, and I do both sides. Um, the, the right side's harder. Um, some centres um, advocate that you do what's called an RV stack, which is essentially axial, uh, but it's aligned to um, be more um, conducive to uh, quantitating the RV because it does get very tricky towards the base and that's where all your error is. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a sec. Um, so here's the um, fourth view that's relevant to the, the right side of the heart. And um, 
nine times out of ten we can just do that as a near um, sagittal view. Um, but it is really important to get it right and a lot of radiographers don't quite get it right. Um, and the main reason for that is sometimes the anatomy is against you and there really is no perfect view that shows the ventricle, the RVOT and the MPA. There just isn't. That's the anatomy. Uh, so you have to be cognizant of what you're trying to achieve. It's an RVOT view. So you want to get above and below the valve and the actual RVOT itself. And for that, a sagittal works really well. Um, and if I think there's something interesting going on, I'll just get a couple more with slightly different angulation to show the, the inferior and superior aspect of it more. And between the three, I'm, I'll be quite happy if I'm looking for dyskinesia at the outflow tract or something like that. Um, and here's an RBOT view. So I've just gone bang up perpendicular to that. And I actually use that for the next view I'm going to show, which is it's not a very good one, actually. It's not perpendicular enough. but um, we get take the RVOT and the RVOT2 and make sure our um, slice for measuring the pulmonary artery flow is per perfectly perpendicular to the flow, which is really critical um, for flow quantitation. So um, we heard all about the prognostic value of um, right ventricular function, both for right and left um, pathology, uh, and therefore quantitation of that is really critical. Um, so what we do um, is we always balance, we always do both sides and we always do both flows. So we've got flow from the right, flow from the left, volume from the right and volume from the left. Um, and if you need to, you can get the flows across the mitral and tricuspid valve, but it's a little harder. Um, and between all those, you pretty much, um, if it's a good study with good gating, you should be um, nailing um, the regurgitant fractions if there are any regurgitations. Uh, and stroke volume on both sides and ejection fraction very accurately. Um, so that's that's how we operate it, and that's a typical flow curve. So what you're measuring here, and this is relevant to, I, I guess, my my overriding obsession, which is 4D flow, is if the flow is laminar, if it's straight down the barrel of the vessel, and you've placed your slice perfectly across the vessel, these numbers will be pretty good. Um, definitely at one and a half t. And with two out of three vendors, I won't uh, say which one, um, you'll be pretty good as well at 3T. Uh, there's a couple of issues with quantitation at 3T with 2D phase contrast for flow. Uh, but most times, if you do it properly, you'll get meaningful numbers. But if you've got turbulence or you're off, um, off with your angles, you, you possibly can get junk or the patient takes a breath or something like that. So back to these circles. This is easy, this is easy, this is hard. So you've got RA, RV, and partial voluming. So you've got an 8 millimeter slice, rapidly changing anatomy, and some quite strange angles, and a lot of volume in the base of, of both the right and left heart, but particularly in the right heart. Um, so what I usually do, uh, I do enough volume that I can do this pretty error free, but if there's odd anatomy or I'm struggling or I think there's partial voluming or a bit of artifact, I'll just have these other views up here so I'll know exactly where I am in 3D space uh, and we've got 3D images as well if I want to go that far. And so I know, for instance, um, where this slice is relative to um, the, the outflow tract or the tricuspid valve and that's really what drives the accuracy. Almost 99% of the accuracy is in, in just in the couple of slices there. Um, so in terms of practice, that's the critical thing I'd say um, for right heart. So here's just a couple of um, uh, random examples. Um, I'm not sure what the diagnosis was in this person, but it was just to show a, a, a couple of variations. So this person's got a bit of dilatation in the pulmonary artery and some interesting flow patterns from my narrow perspective. If that one wasn't spazzing out, you'd see some um, uh, aortic stenosis there inadvertently viewed in the valve shot. In that one, I think it was um, three metres a second. Oh. It'll come good. This one here, which I hope plays, uh, it's actually a tumour uh, in the base of the, the free wall of the left ventricle. Not sure that's going to play. Um, anyways, that's obviously causing some mitral regurgitation. 
Uh, and interestingly in that flow uh, you could quite well see some MR and TR. So, I'm just going to get out of that slide. So here's an RV stack. No, it wants to go. On to, I will go. I'll try and go back to that. I'll, I'll play with fire and um, try and show you the RV stack. I just put this on five seconds ago. Let's not play with fire. <laughs> Um, anyways, the, the RV stack is more or less just an axial stack and if there's a right-sided question, um, I, I usually don't do it anymore to be honest, um, just to speed the exam up a bit because they're already too long. Um, and a longer exam means you can do less patients um, and ultimately it's less viable for the practice so they're going to do less CMRs. Um, uh, but if there is a question or I think for instance there's genuine ARVC, uh, I, I will do it uh, because it's just another look at, at what the anatomy is in better detail. So um, prognostically it's not going well in terms of the videos but uh, the one on the right is a, is a 4D flow uh, image um, and that's a rendered vector set uh, of the whole heart and when we acquire it we take about, um, actually we're down to five minutes now on most magnets for a whole volume of the, the whole chest. So all the flow in the whole chest and we could get, we can actually get, oh god, we can actually get um, all the volumes, all the ejection fractions, all the flows from everything in that five minutes. Um, and that's pretty much why I switched um, you know, into doing primarily cardiac work because I think this technology can change um, how we operate and can turn CMR into uh, a more viable prime time technique. It's never going to do what ECHO can. You can't walk into a room with a probe. but I think it's viable to get patients at a reasonable price point through, which means from a public health point of view it can make a bit of an impact. Um, so here's a right heart specific rendering. So what, what you're seeing here is, is flow um, from the SVC coded red and IBC coded blue. And you're seeing it mix uh, and form a large vortex, uh, which is normally about 80% of the whole flow, lives in this vortex in the right atrium. And, um, and as in the reservoir and conduit phases that forms and then it passes through uh, in the actual contraction phase. Um, so we've depicted that. I, I think that's the best depiction of flow in, in the RA to date. And I stuck this on, uh, it's a different patient, but you can see what I was talking about. Having with that as a context, starting to look at the flows here coming from the SVC and you can see the vortex in those cines from the dephasing. Uh, I'm quite uh, fascinated by that and that's actually clinically relevant. I'll show you some pulmonary um, slides in a second where vortex formation is, is pretty much abnormal and shouldn't happen. So if, if you are seeing swirling patterns in the PA, um, that's an abnormal thing. Um, the previous slides were just explaining what we did and how we made those images. So basically with 4D flow we get that big set of vectors which describes all the flow over the cardiac cycle and we can track those, every single one of those, so millions of streamlines um, and here we've just represented one. Um, we actually fit them by curvature so we can analyse each one of those with a big bank of computers and defining um, each of those by the degree of curvature we can say whether it's in a vortex or not and that pink core is the core of the vortex in the right atrium as it's orientated towards the tricuspid valve. And here's just another depiction of that um, and as it shushes out the um, MPA. So the, the nice thing about that, other than pretty pictures, which probably don't help the patient, um, uh, is that we can actually analyse all of that stuff discreetly um, and however we want. So we can look at membership of the vortex or not, so we can look at disruption of normal flow so, for instance, if you had a reconstructed um, heart or um, even in the context of something stream like a fontan, you could actually specifically say what is the structure of the flow. You could look at where it comes from. Um, you could look at uh, aberrant veins. And then you could look at different fractions of the flow and things like kinetic energy. And here we've done that. We've just um, tagged the flow according to uh, what phase it's coming from. Um, and we can actually just get numbers out of that about 
um, whether whether something goes straight through the RA, whether it stays for one cycle, um, or whether it stays for longer, which is never basically uh, in a normal RA. So if someone had a disturbance in that, you can imagine when we get to the point where there's normal values, we could be very specific about the degree of dysfunction that's present in the RA. Uh, and here's a map of kinetic energy um, in two different views. So he, here's the same thing in the pulmonary artery. That's a normal pulmonary artery, so that's pretty nice laminar flow. Um, the one below, hopefully that starts in a sec, yep. So the one below is pulmonary hypertension. And you can see the difference. So it's the same scale. We've maxed it out at a metre per second, which nothing should go above that in a normal um, pulmonary artery. Uh, but in, pul in pulmonary hypertension, everything's about 25 centimetres a second. So that's the first difference. But it, it forms this uh, whopping grate. You could call it a vortex, but um, my engineers insist it's disturbed flow because it's not quite meeting vortex criteria. <laughs> But you can certainly identify it and quantify it. Um, and this is a really simple first pass um, of, of, of us doing that, where we've basically deconvoluted the flow into flow going along the vessel uh, and flow going uh, around the vessel, so axial or circular flow. Um, and that's, I'll just skip back, that's quite different, obviously, for pulmonary hypertension um, versus controls, uh, where everything's axial in a, in a control, more or less. Uh, and there's this big substantial fracture of, of non-axial flow, uh, which persists much longer in the um, RR interval. Um, the other interesting thing is to look where flow goes and where it comes from. And um, this shows the surprising degree of streaming that exists in the MPA. So basically, if you're on the right side of the MPA, you go down the right uh, pulmonary artery, um, full stop. Um, there's no mixing. Um, whereas when there's a vortex, there's a hell of a lot of mixing. Um, I think it's about 30-40%. Um, here's just um, an illustration of what I was saying before. Um, you've got lots of um, disturbed flow persisting for much longer in the RR interval. And that just doesn't happen in a control. Uh, yeah, sure. So just to wrap up, this is um, some work hot off the press. This is Thursday. Um, so we're doing, we're using the cines as well, um, uh, working on some single shot cine stuff, which takes a single breath hold, which will be a bit more um, speedy. But this is standard cines. Um, so we can get atrial and ventricular strains um, in 3D from a stack. Uh, so we do it on the 2D images, but we combine that data. Um, and this is an interesting first pass analysis of a group where we've got pulmonary hypertension and tetralogy of fallow versus healthy people. And no difference in, in the ventricular strain, but clear differences um, in the um, atrial strain for both the TOF groups. Um, so we, you know, we're still working on this, but um, it's uh, pretty promising, I think, in terms of uh, getting earlier measures um, uh, of, of right um, ventricular and uh, right systemic dysfunction because the key issue really is um, it, right ventricular dysfunction is hugely prognostic but it's a late, a mid and late disease um, sign and uh, if you don't get it early you can't do anything about it and it's probably uh, irreversible disease. So here's the team, uh, Morgane, Catherine and Fraser and Sonny. Um, so Morgane did the strain stuff and Fraser did most of the programming for the 4D. Thank you. Mm -hmm.